Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder. And last time, I talked about Sherman's home life and his possible dalliances outside of his marriage with Ellen. Now I move into more of his battles with politicians. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. Ulysses S. Grant and William T. Sherman forged a friendship that brought the Civil War to a close. As Sherman said, He stood by me when I was crazy, and I stood by him when he was drunk. And now, sir, we stand by each other, always. Their friendship stood strong after the war as well, until Grant became president. Sherman watched in sadness as his friend acted as the nation's chief politician, rather than, as he had hoped, an honorable independent, the same straightforward person he had been during the war. Sherman grew increasingly disillusioned when Grant gave in to Rollins, and, Sherman thought, hurt the army in the process. He was cut even more deeply when Belknap progressively shunted him aside, and Grant meekly promised fairness but never delivered. By the end of Grant's second term, Sherman considered his presidency a failure. He thought Grant had made a grievous error by not supporting the army more strongly, but he was particularly upset at his policy toward the South. The great mistake had been made, Sherman said, in putting all the political power of the southern states in the hands of the ignorant and substantially disfranchising the intelligent classes. This, of course, had not happened, but Sherman thought any attempt at black enfranchisement was an attack on white control. Since Grant did not agree, it was, in Sherman's mind, the result of Grant's unwillingness to stand up to the politicians. His friend had changed, Sherman believed, and the result was the disruption of the relationship that had forged victory over the Confederacy. On the subject of civil rights for African Americans, Sherman was against any move to give them political power. He stated that the Ku Klux Klan was exaggerated, and when it was brought up to him, the African Americans felt that the judicial system was against them in the South because the South refused to allow them as jurors. Sherman responded that if they didn't like the judicial system in their state or county, then they should just leave and go to a place more favorable to them. Because Sherman saw Grant side with the politicians and equal rights for blacks, this strained their friendship and made Sherman happy to see Grant's presidency come to an end. The election of 1876 saw former Union General and Republican Rutherford B. Hayes face Democratic candidate Samuel Tilden. Sherman favored Hayes, but didn't announce his stance publicly because he didn't believe a military man should take public sides. When the election came and no clear winner emerged, the country feared that another civil war may break out. Grant told Sherman to ready the necessary amount of troops to protect Washington. Union veterans wrote to Sherman that they stood ready if he needed them. Sherman did talk with two generals about the situation, John M. Schofield and Winfield Scott Hancock. Hancock advised moderation and no sudden military activity. He said that in the event that no president was chosen by Inauguration Day, then Sherman would be seen as the only recognizable power and that he would be the bulwark in defense of the people and the law. When Congress formed a commission to hammer out the details of the contested election, Sherman began to relax. When the two houses of Congress met to count the electoral votes, Sherman was in attendance. When Hayes became the winner, Sherman agreed with the choice, believing him to be a conscientious, good man of good intellect. Hayes would consider Sherman's former foe and now friend, Joseph E. Johnston, as Secretary of War, but decided against it. Sherman, even though he respected Johnston, didn't believe a former Confederate should hold that position, especially since it was over himself. When Hayes began to remove troops from the South, Sherman believed the country was going in the right direction. However, Congress, with its newly elected members, lashed out at the army, attempting to reduce its size and abilities, trying to restrict its presence in the South. The restriction bill was placed in the funding bill for the army. When debate broke down, Congress adjourned without passing the funding bill for the army. A bill to restrict the size of the army was nothing new. In 1869 to 1870, Sherman became incredibly troubled by a reduction bill that was promoted by one of his close comrades, John A. Logan. Logan believed he could shrink the military's budget by $3 million by reducing its size and reducing the pay of some members of the armed services, Sherman included. Sherman received $19,000 a year for his position, and Logan would stand before Congress and declared, I am willing that he should have all the credit to which he is entitled. 
but because I am willing to give him credit as a great general, that is no reason why I should tax the wooden-legged and one-armed men and the widows and the orphans. To fight back against that bill, Sherman declared, nothing was too good for the valiant officer and soldier during the war. Now how changed, whilst the cry goes forth extending liberty and franchise to all races and to all kinds of men, it is proposed to deny them the very soldiers who sacrificed their limbs and their bodies to attain this result. I do believe that my present pay is not wholly for present work, but is in great part for past services. What money will pay Meade for Gettysburg? What Sheridan for Winchester and the Five Forks? And what Thomas for Chickamauga, Chattanooga, or Nashville? Few Americans would tear these pages from our national history for the few dollars saved from their pay during their short lives. Some politicians were critical of the quality of the soldiers in the Army, including the chair of the Military Affairs Committee, Henry Wilson. Sherman responded, Well, madam, you surely can't expect the possession of all the cardinal virtues for $13 a month. Months went by with soldiers and their officers receiving no pay until October when Congress finally acted. Still, they tried to shrink the army. In December 1878, after a long debate, the committee, now with Ambrose Burnside as its chairman, delivered a report to reform the army. The army's size would stay the same, at 25,000, but they reduced the number of generals, with Sherman's rank expiring when he retired, as well as Philip Sheridan's. Officers' mandatory retirement would be set at 62 years, and generals at 65. However, the bill would die in Congress, and a shorter version died in the Senate. The election of 1880 saw former Union General James A. Garfield take on Winfield Scott Hancock, still a general in the United States military. Sherman approved of Garfield, who became a close friend of his because of his pro-army stance in Congress. However, on July 1st, Charles Guiteau shot Garfield, wounded him severely. Sherman's role in the aftermath of the shooting was to protect the assassin from mob violence. He made all the preparation he thought necessary, bringing in 650 troops into Washington. Sherman conversed with Robert Todd Lincoln, the Secretary of War, and the Secretary of State, James Blaine, about possible violence, and inspected the jail personally. I saw the man Guteau as I passed his cell door, a poor miserable wretch, whose life is not as valuable as that of a chicken, but if that life is taken, it ought to be by due course of law. A mob in Washington would disgrace us all as a people. When Garfield died of his wounds in September, Guiteau would be tried, convicted, and executed with no mob violence. Sherman had pleasant times as commander of all the United States forces. He loved to visit West Point, especially during graduation. He would regale the young man with stories and had a great time reminiscing about his younger days. On one trip to West Point, Sherman, accompanied by some foreign dignitaries, visited his old room at the barracks. The young cadets then occupying the room stood at attention and then became nervous as Sherman began to ask them a question. Did they, like him, keep contraband food hid in the chimney? Sherman grabbed a cane from the group of men and began poking up into the chimney. A host of delicacies fell out, panicking the young cadets. Sherman calmed them by saying that all the officers present were off duty, so they saw nothing. When congressmen attacked the academy in the military reduction bills, it angered Sherman. He believed it to be the best military college in the world and only wanted to see it improve. However, he did oppose any increase in admission standards because he knew how he had been labeled as bad and under the new proposed standards, he wouldn't have been let in. So dedicated to military education, Sherman helped create the School of Application for Infantry and Cavalry at Fort Leavenworth in 1881. Although he believed the true understanding of the military came from being a soldier in an active campaign, he wanted a foundation of education for his officers and soldiers. The Civil War, which had gained Sherman his fame, was one of the reasons people attacked his peacetime army. Politicians and regular American citizens saw citizen soldiers enlist and march off to war, win, and return. Why wouldn't that be the case in any other war, they asked. Why keep a standing army when a militia would do the trick? He directed other military men to direct your argument to the great proposition that war is a science needing education, training, and practice, and that the rank and file must be drilled, instructed, and habituated to the duties of war before being subjected to fire. He wanted professional soldiers as the base of the United States Army. Sherman never could fully understand that the Army was part of the democratic political process and that it was controlled by the politicians who were elected to high positions. 
the Civil War expanded the powers of the President and the generals of the Army. But once the war ended, those powers went away, and Sherman had a difficult time dealing with the loss of power, as well as a loss of objective without a war to fight. 